We have many different levels of well-being and the science of well-being and the implications of well-being represented here on this stage. Um, so all the way down here is uh, my colleague Dan Foy. He works for Gallup. We all know and love Gallup as our, our, <laughs> our pollsters, our, our data folks. And Dan works on the public sector division. He focuses on partnerships to advance the science of well-being, which I think is a really fascinating way for us to kind of enter this conversation. What does the science of well-being say? Um, Dan facilitates collaborations between external innovators, your leading internal teams, uh, and focusing on things like data collection mechanisms, AI methodologies, um, the activation of well-being science across communities, organizations, um, and the individual level. And looks at, Dan also looks at work, workplace development with federal agencies and really large nonprofit healthcare providers. So he'll have some really terrific insights for us about what the, what the data say about well-being. Um, then we've also got Mireya Vargas, who maybe took the longest flight to get here. She's, she had a 12-hour journey to come be with us from Madrid. We're so grateful you're here. Um, Mireya is a fellow at the Distinguished Career Initiative at Stanford and has been an Ashoka fellow since what, what year? 1998. 1998. And for so an OG of the Ashoka Fellows and has probably been been key in advancing the the well-being um, research and programming that Ashoka does on uh, on for both for fellows and externally you are part of the change makers in Spain and Latin America and Mireya's research re work research promotes uh, mental health and physical well-being initiatives and you're really interested in the, the sort of change of mindset of, about one's own mental health. So I'm ex excited to hear your insights on the individual level and looking at a regional context outside of the United States. How is, how is mental health or well-being viewed? Um, and then finally, we've got to have a clinical expert, somebody who can, who's got 6,000 hours of, of uh, what do, what do, cl clinical hours for, for entrepreneurs and, and um, psychiatric care provision. Um, Michael Freeman is the founder of Econa, which is a science-based center of excellence for founder well-being and mental health, highly relevant to our conversation today. Um, he is a psychiatrist and an entrepreneur. Um, has served as an executive coach and researcher, focusing on both the business outcomes and the life outcomes of entrepreneurs. So that intersection, I think, is something that will be very interesting for us to chat about today. Um, also, the founding CMO of United Behavioral Health, right? So that's you know some sort of large scale uh, insights as well for mental health and well-being at the, at the sort of highest levels of, of behavioral health organizations. Um, and Michael also served on the White House Healthcare Reform Task Force under Hillary Clinton. So we have some, some experts here today. And I, um, as our lovely host mentioned, my background is in, I do storytelling for social impact. So I'm interested in figuring out what, do, what does the science say, what does the data say, and how can we use that to influence new audiences? Those of you who are here in this room, might be thinking about well-being from an individual level as an entrepreneur, the isolation of leadership, um, account, how do we integrate accountability, and any number of things. But ideally, what we talk about here will reach beyond just this room and into the organizations that you all represent, the work that you do, and maybe, if we're lucky, our own, our own care. So I would love to start by exploring a little bit about what we mean by well-being. I think there, we, you know, we have however many people in this room and we probably have as many definitions or impressions of what well-being is. Um, there's a whole industry around wellness and adjacent um, pursuits, but that might not be exactly what we mean here. It might be helpful to think through what, what we mean when we say well-being. So, Dan, I would love to maybe start with you from your perspective. When you're working with organizations, what are you what are you meaning when you're looking at well-being data? Sure, it's a great question. So, as the 
the biggest well-being nerd on the stage, just <laughs> empirically. I have an empirical definition of, around well-being. Uh, so at Gallup, we've been studying questions around what makes a life worth living for a very long time, since the 1930s. Uh, our real modern incarnation of well-being research started, though, in the early 2000s when we launched what's known as the Gallup World Poll. Um, this is an annual global study. We're in over 140 countries a year. Um, asking nationally representative samples of the adult population in all these countries, all sorts of aspects about their lives. And when we first set out to undertake this venture in the early 2000s, we were looking for core metrics that would really hold up across societies around the globe. And so we landed on um, this measure uh, called a thriving scale. It's the Cantrell self-anchoring scale for the other big nerds in the audience. Uh, and essentially what we do is we ask people all over the world the first two questions on our survey, how they would rate their lives today on a scale from zero to 10. We use a ladder image. What step of the ladder do you think you stand on? And how they would rate their lives five years from now on that same scale. And so we're measuring both where they are today and where they think they're going to be in the future. And then we break that down into either thriving, struggling, or suffering, depending on how they answer. So we started with that approach. It has really good external validity. It holds up. It aligns with World Bank measures, all sorts of other outcome data, sort of things you would expect. Scandinavian countries do really well on it. U.S. does pretty well on it, not the best in the world. Places like Afghanistan, you have hardly anyone classified as thriving. So it holds up in that regard. But the next step we want to do then is say, okay, well, what predicts thriving? And that's where we got at this idea of well-being. And wanted to ask a lot of questions to try and understand what, what determines that outcome and landed on a set of domains, a holistic definition of well-being. That's one point that's really key, is it's gotta be all-encompassing. It's not just physical health, it's not just mental health. It's gotta cover a whole range of aspects. And so we look at things like social well-being, how people's relationships are doing in their life, community well-being, the place where they live, whether or not they uh, feel it's ideal for them, whether or not they receive recognition for contributing to their community. Um, certainly physical, financial well-being matters as well. Um, and then also purpose, which is maybe the most relevant for folks in this room. Uh, sometimes we call that career well-being. Uh, do you have the opportunity to do what you do best every day? Um, are you really seeing that your, your contributions are having the kind of impact you want? And the other insight, so in addition to it being holistic, is that people to have overall high thriving, they need to be doing well across all of these domains. And so if you're really struggling badly in an individual do domain, maybe you just lost your job, maybe you have an illness, maybe everything looks like it's going great on the surface, but actually you don't have a lot of love in your life, you don't really have those strong relationships, that people's overall scores will suffer. And, and that's kind of the key insight we take away, is that it has to be this holistic picture of what defines a life well lived. Okay, so then I would like to come to you, Dr. Freeman, if you could share a little bit maybe, so you've, you've just heard Dan describe the, the sort of the data picture of well-being societally, and I'm curious to know how that resonates with you from a clinical standpoint and how, how that definition might adjust or shift or what might be similar at an individual level. Thanks, and I'm happy to address that, but first I just wanted to ask a question. How many entrepreneurs are in the room today? If you're an entrepreneur, just raise your you hand. You self-identify as an entrepreneur. That's great. OK, so I will be um, primarily trying to share my experience that I've gained working with people like you. But before I do, I just want to acknowledge what Dan said. He actually is the biggest uh, well, well-being nerd on the stage up here today. <laughs> I used Thank to be you. a lot bigger. Bad news for you guys, as you age, you begin to shrink. So, Dan, you're the guy. <laughs> In terms of how, how I take a look at well-being, there's a vast literature on, on well-being. The OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, has a set of well-being indicators or standards. Uh, that include elements that Dan talked about and some other socioeconomic characteristics. Gallup has developed a set of standards in the, um, in the positive psychology literature and in the entrepreneurship literature. There are two different kinds of well-being that people measure. One is called hedonic well-being, which basically means do you feel good? Um, do you have positive emotions? Are you satisfied with your life? And there's another version called eudaimonic well-being, and what that means is, do you have a sense of purpose? Do you have a sense of meaning? Are you living up to your potential? So 
uh, that's the range, but there, there's a lot of, um, I think, convergence around a couple of key indicators of well-being. From my point of view, as a clinician, kind of how I think about it is, if somebody tells you that all four of the tires on your car are doing great right now while you're driving down the freeway, it's kind of good to know that. But if somebody tells you that there's an 80% likelihood that one of your tires is going to go flat within the next you know, month, that's that's a piece of knowledge that's really more, more meaningful. In the entrepreneurship liter literature, the researchers kind of distinguish between well -being, positive well-being and negative well-being. And by negative, another way they differ, define negative well-being is ill-being. And if you get to the bottom of that, it, a lot of it revolves around mental health and lack thereof. So from a clinician point of view, um, I have tend to focus on how do you know that there's an 80% chance that one of your tires is going to blow up rather than focus on all four tires are doing great right now. And in terms of life outcomes, what's really relevant for entrepreneurs is to know that the relationship between well-being and business outcomes and life outcomes is nuanced. It's not it's not one to one. This well-being equals good life outcomes. Well-being equals good business outcomes. That's kind of happy talk. It's a nice narrative. Everybody wants to believe, but it doesn't actually work out that way. It's more nuanced, and so I've been kind of focused on the nuance. Yeah, the the avoidance of the oversimplification and the sort of causation versus correlation questions. So, Mireya, you kind of, your work sits a bit at the intersection of the, the individual experience for entrepreneurs and the, the, the social, societal um, implications for change makers overall. I would love to hear what well-being means in the context that, that you operate in. Yes, it, it's really interesting because I, I think that all my life I'm thinking about the difference between mental health and well-being. And uh, when uh, I was monitoring different projects in, around the Latin America, uh, we found that it's really difficult to understand what is the limit with, with the uh, well-being and what is, this means in the implication of the cultural complexities. Mm -hmm. uh, Latin America is a very rich region, and you have a different point of view about uh, that affect your personal well-being. And uh, uh, in this, in different moments, I, I was thinking how I can measure different uh, uh, variables to understand better what is well-being in the in this case of social entrepreneurs. And I, I, I remember that I, I was collaborating with the Oxford Poverty and Development and Human Development Initiative. And they have a, a, an area of research that is the, called the missing dimensions. Mm. And uh, I think that this approach is really interesting because they uh, include different uh, dimension that we never think when we talk about the well-being in the communities and, uh, and the people in living in, in the communities. And they talk about the shame and, and about isolation and humiliation or social connectivity of physical safety, empowerment, mm -hmm. and psychological well-being that includes satisfaction with the, the life and, and different dimension, meaningful life and happiness. And I think that the, we, we measure this dimension in, in Chile and Venezuela. Um, 
I think that I was illuminated more about how we can think about this uh, well-being in, in the case of, of the social entrepreneurs that works in the community and have to confront different uh, cultural complexities mm. because they have a native communities, they have a, a, a special focus in the area of the family and, and many, many of things that is really interesting to understand. But uh, I think that this is one of the aspect of well-being. And uh, the other aspect is about the emotion and the, how the emotion impact in your personal well-being. And this is a very, very big question because when you think in, in emotion like uh, shame in, in Latin America or maybe envy, that is really hard but is really deep in, in our countries. And, and you have to explore different dimensions to explain more about what is well-being in, in these cases. Uh, but it's about, I think, that emotion and, and cultural complexities is really important. So I'm struck by the fact that among these three panelists, we hear it crosses a lot of different dimensions when you're measuring well-being from a data perspective. You're looking at, at all of these different um, uh, sort of pieces of the, the the life pie and over time. Mireya, like you mentioned, there, you're looking at the well-being of social entrepreneurs, which what do entrepreneurs do if not solve problems? And social entrepreneurs aim to solve social problems, which means inevitably you are embedded in or a part of or working to address um, various issues that might confront you with questions about the dimensions of well-being that you may or may not have the cultural competency or literacy to even know how to, how to define, much less navigate. And, and as you were mentioning, Michael, the, the individual, at the individual level, there are all of these different um, sort of uh, places on the spectrum that, it, that, that a person might be. And the high level thing that I'm taking away is this complicated. Uh, seems, seems to be the general, the general consensus. Um, but I do think that there is a value in discussing from we, what we know our audience members are, are curious to, to learn about is the connection between well-being and, and founder or entrepreneurial success. Um, and I think each of you would bring a different, a different perspective to that. Um, and Michael, I would love to start with you on this one just because I know that you've done some, uh, some pretty direct examination of this question. And I'm wondering whether you'd feel comfortable sharing some of the results of your, your studies with, with the audience here. Yeah, very happy to. Um, and I, I will in one second, but I just wanted Mireya to pick up on what you talked about with the emotion. And I would say for the entrepreneurs in the audience that pretty consistently positive affect, positive emotion, um, uh, happiness, pride, um, ambition, things of that nature are associated with higher levels of, of well-being. And so, and converse also being true, like distress, anguish, depression, sadness, negative emotions are associated with um, less lower levels of well-being. And as a kind of a, a life hack as an entrepreneur, I would say one skill or technique that you can pay attention to is called emotion regulation. Learn ways like mindfulness, for example, to be able to tolerate distress without being kind of infiltrated by it and to have a more optimistic, positive way of of perceiving the world that you live in. Uh, because as social entrepreneurs, you're living in a pretty distressed world. We all are actually right now. And yet, two different people can be in the exact same circumstance and have a completely different way 
of interpreting it and responding to it emotionally. And so at that level, um, that's where I'd encourage you to focus. With respect to the research, what, we, what we've done, my, I have a bunch of research colleagues from Gallup and also from UC San Francisco, UC Berkeley, and we study the mental health characteristics of entrepreneurs, and what we found is that there's somewhat of a connection and somewhat of a disconnect between... So it's complicated. It's complicated, <laughs> yeah. So for, um, you know, for example, uh, alcoholic drug addict entrepreneurs in one of our studies created had more patents and trademarks, they had higher levels of intellectual pop property. So that might be an indicator of success. Mm -hmm. And um, we found that people who, well, obviously people, are founders who are depressed and anxious are less likely to be able to effectively lead you know, organizations. So that's pretty, pretty straightforward. But with respect to other kinds of mental health conditions, um, people with ADHD, with ADHD is highly prevalent among entrepreneurs. That's attention deficit hyperactivity, and it comes in three different subtypes, and one particular subtype is referred to as impulsive hyperactive, and those people, uh, they often get great results, and they often get really bad results. And um, another one of our findings had to do with bipolar spectrum conditions, bipolar disorder, cyclothymia, bipolar one, bipolar two, hyperthymia, it's kind of a whole uh, range. But people with those mood, particularly mood elevations of a biological nature, again, could have um, positive business outcomes that were not particularly related to a sense of well-being. They could be agitated, irritated, annoyed, angry, and you know, doing pretty well. So um, I would say high level, we found that there's, among entrepreneurs, we found that 38% of founders have mental health conditions of one kind or another over the course of a lifetime we found that 1.7% have a history of psychiatric hospitalization. 3% of the founders that we studied in the Gallup um, panel, uh, uh, Gallup has this panel of about 60,000, 100,000 uh, people that report regularly, professionals who report regularly, and there's a sub-panel of those who are self-employed, and we, um, with Gallup's collaboration, we're able to look at a thousand entrepreneurs. So it was an, a, a representative sample across the entire United States. Three percent of those people had made suicide attempts. So that's a big number. Uh, so a lot of distress. And then what about the entrepreneurs the, that don't have any mental health issues? We, in a different study, we looked at their family members, and what we found is that asymptomatic entrepreneurs tend to come from families where there's a lot of mental health conditions floating around. So an asymptomatic entrepreneur was twice as likely uh, than a control population to have a parent, sibling, or child with a major mental health condition. So what I want you to know about that is that mental health differences are normal for entrepreneurs. You have a different kind of DNA um, you're, not everybody can be an entrepreneur. Everybody can, most people can hold a job. Some people can lead a team or an organization or a club, but very, very few people can start and grow a business. And it's because of basically brain differences, mind differences, that you have personality traits that distinguish you from managers and job holders. That's 50% genetically transmitted. And it's associated with all of your superpowers, but also with your vulnerabilities. Isn't that just the darndest thing? <laughs> the older I've gotten, I have learned that in, in each dimension of life, the things that 
I have the greatest strengths for are also the things that I can, then can, can become maladaptive, right? Our greatest strengths, if, if not channeled in the best or healthiest or most productive or most beneficial way, can, can get in our own way. Um, I also think it's interesting the, that from what you're saying, mental health differences are normal for entrepreneurs. That doesn't mean that we can necessarily say, if you have this, then you will succeed as an entrepreneur. If you experience X mental health or mental illness, then you will not succeed as an entrepreneur. So the, that sort of picture of complication um, becomes a little bit clearer, but we still stop short of saying that we can, we can be uh, prescriptive about it. Yeah, exactly. I didn't ask how many investors are in the room. Are there any investors? Okay, one, thank you for joining us. Oh, two, Joshua. Well, I would say, apropos of that comment, don't make any investment decisions based on what you imagine the mental health of the person you're talking to might be. You're gonna make the, you're gonna make the wrong choice. Make your investment decisions based on the fundamentals. Do you believe in the founder? Do they have an investable team? Is there a market opportunity? Is there a way to get from here to there? Is there a competitive advantage? The things that you usually look at when you make investment decisions. And then deal with the mental health afterwards. I'm, I'm fascinated by the, the notion of, of the sort of cultural, um, uh, what, what, event, what leads to stereotypes that we have about particular mental health conditions or or personas or associations that we might make. What you just said reminded, I mean, I've, Sam Bankman Freed is very much in the news and the idea that there's an individual who cultivated a particular appearance that may or may not be associated with a particular type of mental health, uh, I, I think brings up questions about the sort of cultural identity that, that influences how we perceive well-being and success. And I'm curious, Mireya, from your perspective, you mentioned a little bit about the, the, um, the cultural differences and maybe specific to Latin America or specific to the folks that you're working with. What are you, knowing what you know about well-being for social entrepreneurs in Latin America and in the United States, what does that tell you about how cultural influences play a factor or play a role? Excuse me. Uh, we finished uh, uh, two research uh, about the, the two kinds of social ads of entrepreneurs. One was with the IDB lab and uh, the well-being project, and uh, we explored about the situation of, of the high-impact entrepreneurs, and uh, it and was really interesting because this is a kind of the entrepreneur that have, have a lot of pressure for, for succeed. And, and it's difficult because they have to do it everything that they can to, to succeed because this is the promise. When you find a, 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 fin, a, a founder and, and you put uh, uh, the, the, this found put money in your initiative. You have to succeed, and this is uh, the, the 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 result that they expect. And uh, uh, we we was exploring with 100 high impact entrepreneurs in in all the region, and was really interesting because the the words that we found was the the 80 percent of this kind of entrepreneur have uh, a symptom of, of burnout mm -hmm. they live a situation of burnout and did have a different kind of implication right. because it's really stressful you in, in the case of latin american people you have your family and the family is the center of the, the, all the things that you have in your life. And uh, in this kind of initiative, you have to 
lost the connection with your family because right. you have to uh, make results and, uh, and produce the money. Hustle, and, hustle, uh, hustle. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and it's, it's, re yes, yeah. it's, it's really difficult because you, you lost your, your connection with your rituals, your practices, and all the things that you do it to, to maintain a level of well-being. And uh, around 20% uh, say that hey, it, if they have a low uh, well-being and 66 medium levels, and around 28% have a psychological malice and moderate was 72%. And uh, this have a consequence, and, and we have to think in this when, when we put uh, the social and the high impact entrepreneurs in this uh, rise to to succeed and and it's really difficult to understand. Uh, in the case of social entrepreneurs, was completely different. We we finished the the research uh, three months around, and we found that in this case. The problem is more about depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. the, the, the challenge that the social entrepreneur have to confront is different uh, and put a lot of pressure and this, uh, the, you can find that it's a stress, depression and anxiety is very high in this case. And uh, it's, it's this, the, the same entrepreneur but the, the challenge is completely different and the support in the case of social entrepreneur is, is different. I think that it, if you don't have the, your rituals and you don't have your uh, relationship uh, support, you is very difficult to, to maintain a good level and succeed in, in the in the, in the way that is uh, expecting for you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hearing again the, the, the nuance between and among folks who are social entrepreneurs and experiencing um, varying levels of <clears throat> either continued dedication to the protective factors of their own mental health, which you describe as in Latin America, the rituals and, and the, the idea of, of family connectedness, right? We, we, we know that, that the experience of connectivity, human connection, is a huge protective factor for well-being across a lot of dimensions. And that can butt directly up against what is required of entrepreneurs, which is that you often disconnect from everything else that you're doing to hustle, 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 Absolutely. right? The, the self-imposed self pressure or the externally imposed pressure, sometimes the family imposed pressure, whatever it may be, those, it, there are external factors that can complicate or potentially get in the way of um, us sort of caring for what we know to be our protective factors, mm -hmm. right? Um, Dan, I'm curious to know, hearing what, what both Michael and Mireya just mentioned, um, you have experience kind of at, at each level of um, how we practice or, or build a discipline for well-being, whether it's as an individual leader at a company or um, an organizational partnership level or the sort of broader societal level. And I'm just kind of curious, listening to these, these comments, how do you... How do you account for holding on to the protective factors or building to support them or amplify them while, while mitigating or minimizing the exposure to the things that we know to be more detrimental to, to well-being? Yeah, that's a great question. And How do um, we solve it? That's what I'm asking you. How do we solve it, Dan? <laughs> so it's complicated. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to take those levels you mentioned in reverse order, um, starting with the community level and working back down to the individual. Um, we do work across all these levels in our, our work at Gallup and a lot of this through partnerships with other organizations as well. 
Um, we do a lot of work. Anybody heard of Blue Zones um, out there or watch the documentary? It's pretty great. You should watch it. Um, we work with Blue Zones on all of their community transformation projects that they do around the U.S. Uh, and so this involves going in and really trying to do a diagnostic of what's going on in a community. Usually this is at a city level, um, mid to large size cities that they're coming in and they're saying, we want to be a Blue Zones. We want to we make this transformation happen. Um, and their team is working on doing an initial assessment of all of the things across the city, the policies, the built environment, um, the different you know, access to healthy spaces, access to healthy food, um, and trying to come up with an individualized plan for what they think the city needs. Gallup's piece when we come in then is to put that to the test and really, uh, you've probably heard in some of these sessions things like participatory, um, participatory modeling or participatory action, how do we get the actual people we're trying to serve, how do we get their opinion. Um, I like to think about it like democratizing expertise, how do you go out and actually ask people what they need instead of giving them what you think they need. Um, and that's our piece of this puzzle is coming in and doing surveys across the community using the models I described earlier and trying to understand across these different dimensions of well-being at a really nuanced level, at a neighborhood by neighborhood level within a city, what are the high priorities that really need to be focused on? Where are you gonna get your biggest return on uh, the kind of effort that you're putting forward? Where are you gonna have the greatest impact for this community if your overall goal is to boost well-being in that community? And so starting with that as a baseline and then continuing to come back over time and measure that and say not just, you know, hey, here's what we thought we needed, here was the template and the blueprint, but we've invested a lot of money in these kinds of programs is it getting better? Is it, is it working? Uh, if not, let's focus on something else and figure out why it's not working and move can, on from that. Can you give a couple of examples of what, what some of those programs might entail? So maybe, maybe um, different priorities that have emerged from different communities just for the sake, you know, so we can kind of get a picture of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a couple examples. Um, one project we're just kicking off is uh, actually in Fort Worth, Texas. We're looking at food systems there. And so this is a community that's worked with Blue Zones for a number of years. They're more of a mature partnership. And one of the things that they've learned over the course of their study is that access to fresh and healthy foods, particularly for lower income immigrant communities, is a real challenge that they have. Um, you've got the sort of bodegas on the corner, a lot of junk food, uh, no real green space availability. You know, you just don't have, there's not a Whole Foods down the street, right? I and mean, people wouldn't afford it if there, if there was one. And so we're going in and we're sort of breaking from the survey approaches and we're actually gonna do a lot of qualitative work trying to understand those local food systems and trying to get at things like health behavior models around what are the norms and practices, the self-efficacy around access to healthy food, where are these barriers, and then how can we help local food banks, other organizations that are involved in this work really target for specific communities, for Vietnamese immigrants in the Fort Worth, Dallas area. How do we, how do we help them have more access to healthy food? So that, that's one side of the, the coin. Um, another example, this isn't a Blue Zones project, this is a, a more of an individual initiative we're doing in the city of Detroit where we've gone in, uh, partnered with the Detroit Chamber, a lot of other philanthropies in the community, uh, did a very large study uh, looking at equity and access to city services and outcomes and what, what predicts whether or not somebody wants to stay living in the city of Detroit. For anyone who's read a newspaper in the last 10 years, they know that Detroit has got a problem with population drain and really challenges in the inner urban core. Um, and so going in and trying to understand, again, in sort of a neighborhood by neighborhood level, is it the education system? Is it access to job training opportunities? Is it access to mass transit? What are the things that are really driving whether or not people feel satisfied where they live? And then because we've brought all of these partners to the table, we've got around 30 organizations that are participating in this work. Uh, we have some that are very focused on education policy and teacher training and development and increasing graduation rates. And so we're looking at the data for them at a school by school level. How do we tie people to the schools that are in their local communities? How do we help them understand whether or not you know, people feel safe, whether or not they have access to transportation to get to school, uh, whether or not they think their kids would be better off going to a school in a different area? It's a tough question to ask a parent, but we're, we're asking those kinds of things. And then trying to give them that data so that they can say, we have limited resources. Where are the areas where the need is the most acute, where we can come in and really focus and try and make that kind of change on a systems level? So I, I'm curious to know, based on this, this notion of um, the, the different dimensions of well-being. So if, if, for example, you feel satisfied in your particular area, a lot of us, you know, we've all, we've all sort of are emerging from or have emerged from the, the forced isolation of the pandemic and being sort of 
geographically isolated where maybe we were, we were not previously. So there's been a shift in terms of who we interact with on a day to day, our strong bonds, weak bonds, whether we're going, you know, whether we're taking time to go to the store and we have access to healthy food and we're cooking or we're engaging with, with our, you know, looser ties on a daily basis. Um, Given the shift that's occurred, I'm curious to know, and I'd be, I would like to hear this from both you, Michael, and from you, Maria. Um, are there, what have you seen emerging from, uh, whether it's a post-pandemic universe or, or what have you, about the ways in which we as individuals can, can kind of shore up our satisfaction and overall well-being based on things that may be external to Michael's point, like, or I'm sorry, to Dan's point, like uh, the environment where we are living, maybe my school, my kid's not going to a school that's as good as I'd like it to, and there's not as much access to good restaurants as I'd like, and therefore my work as an entrepreneur, facing the things that I face, I'm actually maybe less able to weather the storm, as, as, you, as you mentioned, that kind of, um, uh, you know what? What is it that that kind of enables us to to power through or navigate through some of the challenges of being an entrepreneur? Right. That thanks. That's a really great question. And as I think about it, and, and Dan, as I think about what you just said, I can appreciate uh, this well-being from two different vantage points. One is well-being as a social impact one well-being as an output, and that what you focus on are sort of policy-driven interventions that have, that increase the likelihood that populations will experience well-being. And that's things like access to good food or uh, uh, proximity to green space and blue space and abatement of noise pollution or air pollution. Um, rule of law has, popped up over and over again as a predictor of well-being on a population basis, sense of safety and security. Um, so you can look at it at that level, but you know the other question is what about at the level of the individual and particularly uh, in our post-pandemic world? And at the level of the individual, you know, as I said before, straight up positive emotion is one of the main drivers of well-being. So how do you get positive emotion? Well, positive emotions a lot um, derive from endorphins and oxytocin. And endorphins and oxytocin, these are brains. Yeah, they're I, you know you like uh, your uh, oxytocin. Love endorphins. Love endorphins. <laughs> Love oxytocin. Well, uh, these are like pleasure chemicals in the brain, if you will, that are stimulated by things that happen between people. So all of the icebreakers that have been happening at this conference, they're all really great. And what, for me, what the, the effect of the icebreakers has been that we're getting these little endorphin pulses. Every time you touch somebody, you experience endorphins and or oxytocin. oxytocin. So the pandemic had this effect of forced isolation, forced separation. And we, and it happened in conjunction with the emergence of um, collaboration software. So these uh, video chat platforms like- We tried to do the metaverse. The, yeah, the metaverse, we, <laughs> it's not, they're, they're not done not with that yet. one yet. <laughs> but you know, Google Meet and Zoom and, uh, Microsoft Teams and Skype and all these things had the effect of giving us the illusion of being in touch with each other where you're in touch except for you can't really touch that person. And I think that that has, I mean, it's not that I don't really think this, it's been demonstrated that that has been a significant driver of feelings of um, isolation and despair and depression and, and things that lead to negative well-being. So I would focus on just the healing power of true, authentic connection with other people. And they can be 
if you're an entrepreneur, you know, when you're in the early stage of your organization, it's a very tight team, and it's a really positive, warm experience. But also friends, loved ones, family, people that are not part of your, your enterprise. Yes, thinking in, in social entrepreneurs, when the pandemic began, we remember that we, we have a program in, in online to talk with social entrepreneurs because they, are, they live a real crisis because they be in, inside house and they Social lost, is literally in the uh, name. <laughs> absolutely, and lost the connection with the, with the community that is the sense of life of the social entrepreneurs. And I think that maybe the, 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 the best thing that we can do it for, was uh, talking, and, and talking about emotion, talking about the dreams that they have, and the images that the, the, these dreams uh, present. And, uh, and I, I think that at the end, the loss of purpose for the social entrepreneur is really, imp I think that with the pandemic was really critical because they feel that they lost purpose in their life because they don't have the capacity to connect with the people in the community or the people that they are attending in, in their initiative. And it's really difficult to, to find purpose when you are isolated and in your house and, and with your family. And it's, it's really difficult to, to, to live it. And I think that the pandemic show us our, our, I don't know, weakness in, in many sense. In, in many ways, it, I think the, the pandemic created for the sort of you know, average person mm -hmm. what probably many entrepreneurs had known all along, which is that sort of experience of being isolated because you've either got, like you said, a, 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 a lean team to start out mm -hmm. with, um, and I, I want to jump to some audience questions because we're getting getting toward the end of our session. And uh, one thing that's come up a couple of times in a couple different ways is this this notion of the stress the stress that we experience by virtue of the fact that we are entrepreneurs, often working on small teams, managing all of the elements ourselves or or with a, a small number of people. Um, and I think a lot of folks are curious whether there are are ways that we can sort of balance or, or navigate the sort of drive to achieve, which I think could be connected to our, our sense of purpose. So maybe that in one way, that in and of itself is a bit of a protective factor if we, if we think that you know, what we're doing is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. But then the, the, the more challenging side of it, which is that notion of, having to do all the things yourself or have, you know, having to manage this sort of very large plate of all of these different things. And are there ways that, uh, that we can, I don't know, kind of, kind of shore that up for ourselves? Um, and I've, I've, that's open to, to any of you. Well, I would say stress management and coping skills are very important. Uh, number one on the list is sleep. Make sure to just get a full night's sleep every night. <laughs> Um, that, that goes by the wayside, uh, and it, sleep deprivation just makes you more vulnerable to everything else. Number two on the list is physical activity, like daily exercise. Daily exercise has been shown in just repeated studies to be um, as effective as antidepressant medication across the board. So that will put you in a good mood. Uh, I think number three is to maintain the, your social universe and then uh, to delegate. If, you're, if you really are an entrepreneur, if you're a leader of an organization, you can't do it all yourself. That's, if you're a craft person, then 
you can run a small like cottage industry type of enter enterprise. But if you're a growth-oriented entrepreneur, you have to be able to delegate and learn how to do that. Um, and then, as I said, mindfulness. Uh, two people can be experience the same stress in very different ways. And so, if, so if you can right, regula regulate the ways in which you react to stress, have a different toolkit for coping with stress, that also helps. Um, Dan, I've got a question for you because a couple folks have asked about what are, what are, are there, and if so, what are they, or what clues do you have to indicate that we have an idea of the structural changes that might be needed, whether it's organizationally, governmentally, um, that we could make for companies to promote founder and staff well-being? Like, what, what, what structures do we need to change and what are the changes we need to make? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm glad you got to that because I'm, I really appreciate my fellow panelists here who have such expertise on the individual level. We're Gallup coming from the top down, right. more so here. Um, and one of the things that really strikes me when we're talking about entrepreneurs and, and new ventures and, and social investment is hopefully you're, all of these entrepreneurs are going to be successful, which means eventually you're going to need employees and managers and an organizational structure around you in order to scale, in order to be sustainable. And that's where a lot of our research does come in, is looking within organizations and trying to understand in best practice organizations where a really high percentage of employees think that the organization cares about their well-being. And that's actually a question we do ask our organizational clients. And if you look at an employee who strongly agrees that their organization cares about their well-being, they have a 90% chance of being fully engaged in the work that they're doing. That in which turn- is huge to prevent burnout. Which is huge for preventing burnout. It's also huge for performance, for retention, for safety productivity, all of these other metrics that have been studied extensively. And so many organizations are focusing on the, the human capital, on trying to drive performance, on innovative performance management techniques, and they're neglecting well-being still. Or they have a, a primitive notion of what well-being really means. And that's where- We offer a yoga class for employees. Exactly. Yeah. There's a yoga class, and you know, maybe there's, you know, there's healthier options in the vending machine or something like that. Great. Great place to start. What we really organ encourage organizations to do, though, is, and, and for the finance types in the room, you're going to love this, is to do an audit of your well-being practices. And I'm, I'm serious about this, but looking at saying, you know, think about, again, we've got a, a five-factor model that we like to use, whatever model you want, a holistic model of well-being, and say, what are we doing with, with policies? What are we doing with incentives? What are we doing with facilities? What are we doing around communication, recognition for employees? Within each of those domains, you're probably not doing something in every domain. You're probably over-indexed to some aspects. Maybe you've got great physical well-being benefits, but you're not really doing anything around community well-being. Maybe you're doing a great job with incentives. There's an exercise reimbursement program, but are you recognizing people for running their first marathon and telling the whole company about how great that is? And so there's so many opportunities sort of right there on the table for organizations to start with. The second piece and the harder piece is really about the leadership on down modeling that change and empowering managers who often are not comfortable talking about well-being with their direct reports. They do not, that's not their job. I'm here to manage their work. I'm here to make sure they show up, make sure they don't steal stuff out of the back and do all these things. And having those kinds of holistic conversations about what's going on in somebody's life, that's a skill that managers and leaders need to learn. And there's ways to teach those sorts of skills. So that would be my my points to think about as you're growing your enterprise, as you're having success, is how are you going to start really building strong structures and the scaffolding across the people that are going to make that organization run so that the people on the front line who are doing the day-to-day -day work can thrive within your culture? I think that probably is a, a good place to help help us wrap up. Um, I We do have one question here that I'm just kind of curious about, I think is a quick answer. Are, are there publicly available well-being assessment tools um, that, that any of you would, would recommend? There are many of them. Yeah. Yeah, there are many of them. The one that is commonly used is called the WHO5, and it's developed by the World Health Organization, five questions. It's been used in lots of populations, and you can compare yourself to, yeah, or you can compare one population to the, ne to the next. But there are about a dozen other ones, too, but there's, a, yeah. There, there are a lot of them. Can I make one other comment on publicly yeah, available data? Um, 
it's come up a couple of times, uh, loneliness, social connections. Um, we, we made some jokes about the metaverse a moment ago. Um, Gallup is actually, right now, earlier today, we had an event in DC announcing the release of our first official statistics on global loneliness in partnership with Meta, uh, who sponsored this research. And it's some really interesting findings. The full report comes out next week, free to download. Encourage people to look at that. Um, just a couple of quick headline findings coming out of that. One in four people around the world, adults globally, report that they feel lonely often or always, uh, which is a striking thing to think about, right? That's yeah. one of us on this stage, if we're yeah. talking about one in four, would always feel lonely. Um, and interestingly, we actually see a, a reverse relationship to what you would normally expect, which is that younger adults are more likely to report loneliness than older adults when we look globally. Um, and then the report will go into all sorts of additional details around the kinds of social connections. Uh, Meta, of course, would love it if it was all digital connections that were really successful. What we actually find, Michael, to your point, is in-person human connection far more important. And so another thing I've been thinking about in this conference is a lot of these digital tools and, and new innovations that are out there, how are they bringing people together in the real world? Because that's where the real impact is going to happen is between yeah, humans. I, I agree. It's you know, My take on it has been that these digital mental health apps actually make mental health worse. I think that uh, we have a publication with social, uh, Stanford Social Innovation Review in Spanish that uh, we published a, a recent uh, article about the well-being in the social entrepreneurs that is a very good level of information. And I, I, in, I think that I will invite you to review the, uh, the page, uh, the web page of the Wellbeing Project, that they have uh, many tools that is really interesting to explore in the, in the field of inner well-being and social well-being and different levels of, of and use different indicators and apps and many things that is, could be really useful. So the, the thing that I have taken away from, from this conversation has a lot to do with what, what we've typically called the, the weak ties, but in actuality, what, we've, what we're learning, and I'm really excited to learn more about this research that you all have coming out, Dan, is that this, this notion of that in-person connection, which we lost a little bit of when we left the office and we're at home, right? I, my barista, you know, I would find myself all of a sudden I'm in a five minute conversation and she's like, can you, I have to take more orders. But there's the hunger that we have to connect with people, even if it's not about something that is, that is, you know, uh, uh, relevant to every other facet of our life. The connect, the connectivity, the ability to um, to maintain those connections as we're doing entrepreneurial work, as we're navigating social situations or issues that we're trying to improve, um, keeping those sort of front and center feels feels like that seems like while it is complicated, it seems like that is one takeaway that we we can all agree on. So thank you all for bringing your your expertise and and your insights. We really appreciate it.